We now come to the statement where we have the Deputy Foreign Secretary, Andrew Mitchell. Uh, with permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on Israel and Gaza. Over seven months since the horrors of October the 7th, there is no end to the current conflict in sight. This Government wants to bring the conflict to a sustainable end as soon as possible. But as so often with conflicts of this nature, the question is not about our desire for peace, but rather about the best means of achieving it. We continue to believe that the fastest way to end the conflict is to secure a deal which gets the hostages out and allows for a pause in the fighting in Gaza. We would then have to work with our international partners to turn that pause into a sustainable permanent ceasefire. Building momentum towards a lasting peace will require a number of elements, including removing Hamas's capacity to launch attacks against Israel. It was a deal of this kind which secured a pause in the fighting before Christmas, the only such pause since Hamas's horrific attack. And it was this approach which the United Nations Security Council endorsed just last month following some effective British diplomacy. A deal with Hamas for a pause in the fighting would involve exchanging hundreds of Palestinian prisoners charged with serious acts of terrorism in return for the hostages' release. I do not underestimate, Mr Speaker, how difficult this must be for the Israeli government, but it is the best way forward we see right now. We continue to work closely with the United States and partners in the region to support such a deal, and we do not believe that the ICC prosecutor seeking warrants will help in this regard. As we have said from the outset, we do not think the ICC has jurisdiction in this case. Uh, Mr Speaker, a deal, as I have described, offers the best prospects of reuniting more hostages with their families. The anguish for them is unbearable. I am sure the whole House joins me in holding the family of Nadav Popplewell in our thoughts at this deeply distressing time. We are still working intensively to establish the facts after the awful video his Hamas kidnappers released last week. And the Foreign Secretary met the family last week to hear more about their ordeal firsthand. Likewise, we send our condolences to those families whose loved ones the Israeli authorities stated last week had died. At the same time, the toll on civilians in Gaza continues to rise. Images from the Strip give us some sense of what they endure. Civilians piling belongings onto a cart led by a donkey or seeking to scrape together a meal in a makeshift shelter. We have seen appalling attacks on aid convoys and UN offices by Israeli extremists and the tragic deaths of UN and other humanitarian personnel in Gaza. We keep in close contact with Sigrid Karg, the UN humanitarian coordinator, and we condemn all attacks on aid workers and support the United Nations call for an independent investigation. The Government of Israel has previously set out publicly their commitments to increase the flow of aid into Gaza significantly. But we need to see far more. The Prime Minister impressed the urgency of this on the 30th of April. In the past 10 days, the Foreign Secretary has spoken to Israeli ministers Ron Derma and Israel Katz. He has called on them to implement in full Israel's aid commitments. We want to see humanitarian aid allowed to enter through all relevant crossing points including in Rafa, critically needed goods flowing in, particularly fuel and medical supplies, effective deconfliction processes to ensure that aid can be distributed safely and effectively, critical infrastructure restored and protected, evacuations for all those eligible, concrete action to protect civilians and minimise casualties. And as Israeli Minister Benny Gantz said over the weekend, more planning for reconstruction and a return to Palestinian civilian governance of Gaza once the fighting has ceased. We remain, Mr Speaker, absolutely committed to getting aid into Gaza to alleviate the suffering, and we are working with a wide variety of other governments and aid agencies to deliver aid by land, sea and air. 
I am delighted to confirm to the House that we have now successfully delivered British aid onto Gaza's shore using the Cyprus Maritime Corridor, which we and our partners, notably the United States, the UAE and Cyprus, made operational just last week. We have committed almost £10 million in funding. The Royal Fleet Auxiliary Cardigan Bay is acting as a logistics hub for the operation, and we have now delivered over 8,000 shelter coverage kits alongside aid from the US and UAE. With more aid to follow in the coming weeks, including hygiene kits and forklift trucks, and work to develop, develop other effective partnerships for the delivery of aid continues. Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon is in Qatar today discussing a health partnership for Palestinians so that British Medical Training Agency can support doctors and health practitioners treating Palestinian patients. And we know that much, much more aid is required, but that delivery by land remains the quickest and most effective option. So we continue to work closely with Amman to maximise the aid delivered via the Jordan Land Corridor. I pay tribute, Mr Speaker, to all those, including aid workers and military personnel, diplomats and medical professionals, who are involved in Britain's efforts to save lives and alleviate the suffering of civilians in Gaza. And I can confirm to the House that last week intense efforts by the Foreign Office led to the departure from Gaza of three British aid workers who were at risk from an outbreak of fighting. Mr Speaker, as the fighting continues, we now estimate around 800,000 Palestinian civilians have fled from where they were seeking shelter in Rafa to other parts of the Southern Strip. The extent of this displacement is why we have been clear that we would not support a major Israeli military operation in Rafa unless there was a very clear plan for how to protect people and save lives. Mr Speaker, we have not seen that plan. And we and 13 of our partners, including France, Germany, Italy and Australia, set out in a detailed letter our concerns to the Israeli government. Mr Speaker, after over seven months of fighting, it is becoming difficult to imagine the realisation of a lasting peace. But Britain continues to try to build momentum towards that goal. This will require not only the release of all the hostages and an end to the current fighting, but also the removal of Hamas's capacity to launch attacks against Israel, Hamas no longer being in charge in Gaza, the formation of a new Palestinian government for the West Bank and Gaza, and a political horizon for the Palestinians providing a credible and irreversible pathway towards a two-state solution. This is what we continue to strive towards, peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians alike. I commend this statement to the House. So the Secretary of State, David Lamy. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement? The conflict has now go up, gone on for 226 days. That's 226 days of destruction. It's 226 days of Israeli hostages still in chains. It's 226 days that have led to 35,000 Palestinian deaths. And 226 days where the risks of further regional escalation worsen every day. We will re keep repeating our call until it happens that there must now be an immediate ceasefire, as this House supported through Labour's motion and as demanded by the United Nations Security Council resolution. Diplomatic pressure must now go into overdrive to bring the fighting to an end. Labour has been opposed to an Israeli offences in Rafa for months. The UK Government should now work with the United States to try to prevent a full-scale Rafa offensive. By being clear, it will assess UK exports and, if the full-scale Rafa offensive goes ahead, join our American allies in suspending weapons or components that could be used in that offensive. When we last met on this subject, 
I asked the Deputy Foreign Secretary to confirm whether he or the Foreign Secretary has received any assessment, not legal advice, but any assessment or policy advice from Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office officials that the threshold has already been met. He dodged the question. He did not answer. So I repeat that question to him today, and the whole House will be interested in his response. Last November in this House, the Deputy Foreign Secretary appeared to row back on Boris Johnson's shameful abandonment of the International Criminal Court when he said it is not for ministers to seek to state where the ICC has jurisdiction. The Prime Minister followed up in December when he said we are a strong and long-standing supporter of the International Criminal Court. But in his statement today, yes. the government have backtracked. Yes. 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 U-turning of one of Britain's most fundamental principles, yes. respect yes. of the rule of law. Yes. Labour has been clear throughout this conflict that international law must be upheld, yes. that the independence of international courts must be respected, yes. and that all sides must be accountable for their actions. I asked the Minister very simply, does he agree? <coughs> Arrest warrants are not a conviction or determination of guilt but they do reflect the evidence and judgment of the prosecutor about the grounds for individual criminal responsibility. Labour's position is that the decision by the International Criminal Court Chief Prosecutor to apply for arrest warrants is an independent matter for the court and the prosecutor. Does the minister agree? Labour believes that the International Criminal Court's independence must be upheld and respected and that it is right that the conduct of all parties is addressed by the court. Does the minister agree? Labour believes that the focus of politicians should be on achieving an immediate ceasefire to end the war in Gaza, free the hostages, alleviate the humanitarian crisis and create a pathway towards a lasting political solution. Does the minister agree? And Labour believes that the UK and all parties to the Rome Statute have a legal obligation to comply with orders and warrants issued by the court. Democracies who believe in the rule of law must submit themselves to it. Does the Minister agree? So Labour supports the ICC as a cornerstone of the international legal system that supports allies regardless of the court's focus, whether it is in Ukraine, Sudan, Syria or Gaza, does the Minister agree? Yeah. These get to the heart of a simple question. Does the Conservative Party, the party of Churchill, who was one of the founders of our international legal framework, does the Conservative Party believe in the international rule of law or not? Yeah. Yeah. Foreign Secretary. Well, may, may I start, um, Mr Speaker, uh, in response to the Shadow Foreign Secretary by uh, assuring him, in answer to his final question, that the answer from the Government, as he would expect, is yes. And uh, I think it's worth saying that if one uh, looks carefully at his uh, high-flown oratory this afternoon, we do not see very much of a distinction between the position of his Majesty's opposition and the uh, government. And, and uh, as, I, as I will uh, set out, uh, Mr. Speaker, now he starts off by uh, saying that this is day 226 of uh, the incarceration of the hostages, of the destruction that has taken place, and of the risks of escalation. And uh, I completely agree with what he says, and he says that the diplomatic pressure must rise, 
I can tell him that the diplomatic pressure is intense on all counts and in all places, and he says we must work uh, closely with the United States of America. Let me assure him that we are working intensively and closely with the United States. He asks me about the advice uh, we receive and suggests that I dodge the question on the earlier occasion, Mr Speaker. I certainly had no intention of uh, doing so. And I can tell him that we receive all sorts of advice from all sorts of places. But we do not, uh, as is the custom and practice, as he knows well, disclose our legal advice, but we are always careful to follow it uh, meticulously. And that is my answer to his uh, question. He asks, uh, is it a matter for the court uh, acting um, independently? And my answer again is, of course it is. But we don't necessarily have to stay silent in our view on what the court is doing, and uh, we certainly are not. And for his question about uh, the letter from a former Prime Minister, as we have said from the outset, we do not think the ICC has jurisdiction in this case. The UK has not recognised Palestine as a state, and Israel is not a state party to the Rome Statute. But as I say, Mr Speaker, I think if we split away uh, some of uh, what he said today and the oratory which he customarily displays in this place, we see that the position of the opposition front bench and the government remains very closely aligned. Chairman Select Committee, Alicia Cairns. Speaker, my condolences go out to all the families who have received the most devastating news over the last few days that their loved ones have been murdered, and also to the Popperwell family who have received heinous treatment from Hamas with the publication of that outrageous video. Last week, the committee pushed the Minister for the Middle East to do more to get proof of life for those who have been held hostage, and that remains the call from our committee. Can I welcome the effort on the maritime ports? It is good that that is now in place. However, it will be unable to function come September due to the changes in the tide that will then come in. So this is a short-term solution. Since the 6th of May, when the Rafa offensive started, there have been only 40 trucks that have gone in through the Karem Sharon crossing. In Rafa, no fuel has gone in, no medical evacuations have taken place. As aid agencies have started to suspend sending in their own people. And that is extremely concerning. So my question is, when will the Rafa crosser reopen? And will the Erez West crossing finally accept aid, not just through Jordan, but also through Ramallah? Because otherwise, the amount of aid needed is just not going to get in. Well, I, I thank the chair of the Select Committee uh, for her uh, remarks. Um, she made the point, I think, before about proof of life. And uh, as she knows, this is something which my noble friend, Lord Ahmed, has been uh, pursuing in direct response, I think, to her uh, committee. She makes the very good point, Mr Speaker, that the uh, maritime option will only go on for as long as the sea conditions are satisfactory. And that emphasises the importance of getting aid in by road, one of Britain's specific uh, demands of the Israeli government. And she points out that Rafa has effectively been closed for the last uh, few uh, weeks. Um, and the uh, great difficulties that that causes. And we hope very much that there will soon be a deal between Egypt and Israel to put that right. We go to SNP spokesperson, spokesperson Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We go down a dangerous road, Minister, if we believe that the rule of law is something from which a government can pick and choose. So unlike the government, we very much welcome the decision of the International Criminal Court to issue arrest warrants for the Hamas leaders Sinwar, al Masari, and Hanye for crimes against humanity and war crimes committed on and subsequent to October the 7th. We have always unreservedly condemned the appalling Hamas attacks, their murders and their hostage taking, and we repeat our calls for the immediate release of the hostages. Given the ferociously disproportionate Israeli response, one which has seen 35,000 dead, 100,000 injured, tens of thousands of children orphaned, a civilian infrastructure in ruins, the cutting off of food, water, electricity and medical supplies. We also welcome the ICC filing applications for the arrest warrants of both the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the Minister of Defence Yov Gallant for war crimes and crimes against humanity. 
The ICC say they have evidence, including interviews with survivors and eyewitnesses, which show that Israel has intentionally and systematically deprived the civilian population of Gaza with what they need to survive. And they refer specifically to Israel using starvation as a weapon of war and intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population, all acts which constitute a crime against humanity. The ICC has confirmed everything that we have said about the crimes of October the 7th and Israel's use of a collective punishment and ethnic cleansing in response to those crimes. For eight months, this government has told us that it cannot make an assessment on breaches of international humanitarian law, but it has today, because it suits them, made an immediate assessment on the decision of the International Criminal Court, whose panel of experts is predominantly made up of UK lawyers, and they have done so simply because it does not agree with it. It is shameful and unforgivable that for eight months this government has chosen to deny the evidence of their own eyes and given political cover and munitions to Israel. And we have to assume that if today does not put an end to the UK licence of arms export to Israel, then sadly, absolutely nothing will. Well, Mr Speaker, the position is simply not in respect of the ICC, as the Honourable Gentleman set out. And the ICC has done nothing of the sort in what he described. He suggested that they had already found the answer to these allegations, had already <laughs> exercised uh, their answer. And the truth is that uh, the pre-trial, pre-trial chamber now needs to consider the evidence and then reach a judgment. So, so let, us, uh, let us not uh, jump through uh, all these hoops uh, at once when they are simply not there to be uh, jumped through. He uh, also asks, as indeed did the Shadow Foreign Secretary, about uh, whether uh, we are playing fast and loose with the rule of law. We are certainly uh, not, and I hope that he will attend the main debate today when he will uh, see exactly what the government thinks about the rule of law in all uh, cases. And uh, just, because, uh, just because you support the uh, role of the ICC does not mean you have to be devoid of a view on what it is saying, and the government is giving uh, its uh, view. And as I said, Mr Speaker, we do not believe that seeking warrants will get the hostages out, get aid in, or deliver a sustainable ceasefire, and that remains the UK priority. Sir Julian Lewis. This question is in my personal capacity, Mr Speaker, not as Chairman of the ISC. Um, in general, I am a strong supporter of the work of the ICC. The terrorist attack was undoubtedly designed to provoke an overreaction by the Israelis and to polarise societies, and it has succeeded in both those aims. May I encourage the Minister to encourage the House in turn to read the, IS, uh, the ICC's um, statement in full. It's helpfully available online. And may I urge people with a partisan view on either side of this uh, atrocious uh, issue to take on board seriously what the ICC is saying about the activities of the side they support as well as the side they oppose. Um, Mr Speaker, I think my uh, right hon. Friend makes a good point about ensuring that the debate is informed by uh, facts. Uh, and not by rhetoric. Don Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I'm a little bit confused. The government has previously said that they will not endorse any military operation into Rafa because that would be against international law. The minister today said um, that uh, unless there was a very clear plan of how to protect people and save lives, what's changed? Mm. Mr. Mr Speaker, nothing has changed at all. We have repeatedly made clear that we cannot support an attack on Rafa without seeing a, a detailed uh, plan. Clearly, that means a constructive plan which abides by IHL on all counts. 
Sir Michael Ellis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right hon. Friend agree that this is a grotesque overreach by the ICC? Courts must also act within the rule of law, and the jurisdiction of a court is something that it is not for itself to judge. The Statute of Rome, which set up the International Criminal Court, clearly delineated the powers of the court. The US and the UK have both previously said that the ICC does not have jurisdiction. Under its founding charter, it can only act against a sovereign state, which is a signatory. The US and Israel are not signatories. Dozens of other countries are not signatories, and Gaza is not a sovereign state. So, putting aside for a moment any purported evidence, the court does not have jurisdiction, and like any other court, like a traffic court or a magistrate's court, it has to act within its powers, the powers set up for it by the international community. So isn't it true that the ICC is acting out with its powers and setting itself up, sadly, as a political court? Well, Mr. Speaker, I made clear what uh, our position is towards uh, the ICC. But uh, in respect of what my uh, right honourable and learned friend says, I think that many people will agree with what Benny Gantz said this morning. And he said the following. Placing the leaders of a country that went into battle to protect its civilians in the same line with bloodthirsty terrorists is moral blindness. Sir George Howard. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Many of us on all sides of this House have supported the right of Israel to exist and consequently the right of Israel to defend itself over many years. And we've also condemned the appalling atrocities that were carried out by Hamas on October the 7th. But as the right honourable gentleman said in his statement, after seven months of fighting, it's becoming difficult to imagine the realisation of a lasting peace. And I agree with him with that. But doesn't he agree with me that until Israel realises that it has to listen to those friends in this house and around the world and take responsibility for its own actions, then we are, our support for them is declining yeah. rapidly. That's absolutely yeah. right. Well, the the, the um, right honourable gentleman, uh, I think, accepts that Israel has the right of self-defence, but, but it must exercise it within international uh, humanitarian law. And he, he makes a point which I think is so important, that we have to lift people's eyes to what a future settlement based on a two-state solution looks like when this appalling catastrophe is over. And a great deal of work is going on behind the scenes with regional partners, with great powers and with, through the United Nations to try and make sure we can lift people's eyes and that there is a deal to be done which at long last would draw the poison from this terrible situation. Andy Percy. Mr Deputy Speaker, facts are important and the facts have not changed since October the 7th, which is that it is Hamas who embed themselves in civilian areas and use civilian instructions and put their own people at risk um, uh, in this conflict. It is Hamas who have committed rapes as a weapon of war. It is Hamas who are still holding innocent civilians uh, hostages. And it is Hamas who went into Israeli communities on October the 7th and butchered 1,200 people, including slicing the breasts of women and the limbs of children. On the other side, we have the democratic, liberal state of Israel with an independent judicial process, a Supreme Court which is respected internationally and which the ICC is supposed to respect. And yet there are people in here who, from day one, have done very little uh, to call out some of the other behaviour and everything to hold Israel to a standard they do not hold others to. That is why the Czech Prime Minister and the... Can you... Yeah, that's the point, that's there we are. So we are holding please, to please, can everybody focus on a question? Focus on a question. Because I'm not quite sure I heard a question there. But no, 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 no,
Well, Mr. Speaker, my, my honourable friend speaks with uh, great passion and feeling on this subject, and he, I think, will be one of those who I said might well agree with what Benny Gantz has said this morning, and I read into the record exactly what he said, and I think there will be large numbers of people, both in this place and outside, who will think that what Benny Gantz said made a lot of sense. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Cyprus Maritime Corridor is welcome, but it risks acting as a fig leaf for the fact that there is not enough aid getting into Gaza. The Kelowna report found that Israeli authorities have yet to provide proof of their claims that UN staff in Gaza are involved in terrorist organisations. For the supply of aid to those Palestinians in Gaza who are innocent, the UN Relief and Works Agency is the only serious organisation capable of it. Yeah. Why won't the British Government follow the lead of our Australian, Canadian and European allies and reinstate funding to UNRWA? Yeah. Well, um, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his, his uh, comment. Um, as far as the maritime access is concerned, he is right that the best solution always from the beginning of this has been access by road. That is by far the easiest and quickest way and least expensive way of getting aid to desperate people. And so he is entirely correct about that. In, in respect of the Kelowna report, I can say that we are still waiting for the OIOS report from the United Nations, and I'm advised that there has been good cooperation between the United Nations and the Israeli authorities on, on that. And on UNRWA, as I've said, we are waiting for that report. Uh, the House, uh, I think, should expect that we will be restoring funding to make sure that uh, humanitarian support is available through that uh, mechanism. But he, I'm sure, will reflect upon the appalling events which were revealed about members of UNRWA staff, and we must complete the process uh, which I set out. Richard Graham. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the Israeli War Cabinet looks divided. Chief of Staff is pressing for a day after strategy. The Defence Minister has outlined his concerns, and the former Defence Minister and Chief of Staff, Benny Gantz, has asked to see the government's post-war plan for Gaza Strip with six strategic goals, all of which, and perhaps my right honourable friend would care to comment, look very similar to those that he has outlined as our own goals. He, the defense, former Defence Minister has threatened to resign if the plan isn't announced by June the 8th. Is he going to have to resign, or are there chances that there will be a plan which both he and us could agree with? Well, I very much hope my honourable friend is correct in saying, uh, and indeed hoping, that there will be a plan, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, what he uh, shows in his uh, perceptive uh, question is that there are many voices uh, in Israel. And the fact that he quoted two such senior figures, one seeking to know what the day after strategy is, and the other one wanting to see a post-war plan, underlines the response which I gave a moment ago uh, to the other side of the House, uh, that we have to lift people's <coughs> eyes to the fact that, that this dreadful conflict will come to an end, and we will then need to have a plan to ensure that uh, the future is very different from the past. And I remind the House that the tremendous progress that was made in Oslo at the Oslo Accords took place on the back of the Intifada. So, out of great darkness, we must ensure that a proper plan comes forth. Sana Begum. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain how this government can possibly justify continuing to support a military campaign that has involved denying civilians electricity and basic services, the starving of civilians and blocking of aid, the bombing of civilian infrastructure, the forced displacement of millions, the killing of journalists and aid workers, and the killing of civilians, including large numbers of children on an unprecedented scale? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, we, we don't support that. What we, what we support is Israel's right of self-defence, but must, it must be carried out within international humanitarian law. James Sunderland. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think there is a danger from the scope and the timing of the ICC arrest warrants that somehow moral equivalence might be implied, but it is quite clear that the fighting should stop. Can I please ask the Minister what he thinks the impact will be of those warrants? Well, my honourable friend makes a most interesting point. This smacks of an unworthy, indeed ludicrous, uh, sense of moral equivalence between a murderous 
proscribed terrorist organisation and the democratically elected government of Israel, seeking, seeking to protect uh, its citizens and recover its 124 remaining hostages. Lawrence Shalami. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think when we are talking about the role of the ICC, ICC it's not about whether it's moral. It's about ma making sure a democratic state falls within the rule of international yeah, law. Yeah, yeah. As 35,000, as it's estimated, 35,000 people have been killed. 132 hostages are still held. The Arab League have now called for an immediate ceasefire, deployment of a UN peacekeeping force yeah, yeah. in the West Bank until a two-state solution is negotiated. Will the Deputy Foreign Secretary answer my right on um, the member for Tottenham's question, which he failed to, in terms of that offensive in Rafa, and will we join our American allies in responding and stopping all war components being sold? Yeah. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that is not what the American government has done. They have suspended one shipment, but they have not uh, stopped any of the other uh, supply. And in the first part of her uh, question, the government continues to seek a pause in the fighting, which can lead to a sustained uh, ceasefire, and also get the hostages out and aid in. Tobias Elwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Deputy Foreign Secretary speaks about a ceasefire, speaks about getting the hostages out, speaks, uh, speaks about getting the aid in and talks to resume. But can I ask him to address the bigger picture? Because behind... Hezbollah, behind the Houthis and behind Hamas, sits Iran, arming and training these extremist non-state actors. And as much as we debate the possible long-term governance and security solutions for Gaza, they are unlikely to stand the test of time until the challenge of Iran's disruptive proxy influence across the Middle East is challenged. Now, Iran's destabilizing foreign policy is determined by the President, by the Supreme Leader, and by the foreign minister. Two of those three were killed in a helicopter crash on the weekend. It's clear for Iran to determine who replaces those. But can I ask whether we can advance our own robust policy to stand up to Iran's proxy influence? Otherwise, we will never secure lasting peace in Gaza. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, my... Uh Right Honourable uh, Friend, the former Chairman of the Defence Select Committee, is right about the malign influence of Iran uh, th through, <coughs> the, through its proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas and the Houthis, on the situation in the Middle East. And we hope that Iran will cease to disrupt uh, in the way that it does through its uh, proxies. And it may well be that the events of the weekend offer an opportunity for a reset. Justin Matters. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I understand the government's position on the International Criminal Court, it's because Israel were not a signatory to the original treaty and because uh, Palestine is not a sovereign state, they don't believe that they have jurisdiction. Well, I, I think that leads us to a place where anyone can opt out of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court at any time. I think that's a terrible place for us to be as a government uh, yeah. and a country. But if he doesn't agree with that, will he at least agree with me that the uh, letter from the 12 senators from the United States to the ICC, where they said, target Israel and we will target you and we will make uh, sure all American support for the ICC is withdrawn, is not a place this, this government will ever be in? Yeah. Well, of course, the Americans are not a member of the court, whereas uh, the United uh, Kingdom is. But the point the honourable gentleman makes is an important one, because in this uh, debate, uh, about these uh, terrible events and the appalling consequences which have resulted. It is important that everyone chooses their language with care. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. The Deputy Foreign Minister rightly draws attention to the false moral equivalence inherent in the ICC statement between the actions of sovereign democratic Israel and the most brutal activities of a terrorist organisation. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that that false moral equivalence is always drawn by the enemies of Israel as a way to delegitimise yeah. the Jewish state. And does he share my concern with this move by the IEC, not just because of the sucker that it gives terrorist groups elsewhere around the world, but the risks within it for ourselves and our own troops as they go about defending our interests around the world? Well, my, my right honourable friend um, expresses himself, as always, with great lucidity. Uh, and I think it's very important that that message does not get sent. And that is why I uh, repeated what Benny Gantz 
had said, and also in response to our honourable friend, who is no longer uh, in his place, why I think that the sense of moral equivalence is repugnant. She on Warren. Thank you. On April the 5th, the Foreign Secretary called for an independent inquiry into Israel's killing of seven aid workers, including three Britons. Now, I have repeatedly raised Israel and particularly the IDF's lack of accountability and examples of misconduct with the Minister, and it is clear that here, as in other areas, the government is backtracking on the limited assurances given, despite investigations from the BBC, amongst others, showing IDF misconduct continues despite pledges and commitments to the country from Israel. So, will the minister say yes or no? Does he believe that Israel should investigate itself, regardless of the horrors committed? Well, as, as the Honourable Lady will know, Israel has a rule of law and has the ability to <laughs> investigate uh, these matters. But, but, but uh, she is entirely correct to say that the Foreign Secretary made clear we expect an independent, uh, a, a detailed independent investigation. Uh, Israel has uh, taken a number of steps. She will have seen the, the, uh, the acts that were taken against those who were responsible for the decisions made in those attacks. And uh, she will be pleased to know that we are considering with our allies the best way to inject further independence into that investigation. Mark Logan. Speaker, my constituents in Bolton today are livid because they have seen through the International Criminal Court that there is evidence that acts committed to use starvation as method of war and violence, evidence that collectively punishing the civilian population of Gaza and evidence that Israel has intentionally and systematically deprived the civilian population in all parts of Gaza of objects indispensable to human survival, never mind being on the right side of history. Will we ensure that we are on the right side of the present? Well, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact that the prosecutor has applied for arrest warrants to be issued does not directly impact for example, on UK licensing decisions, but we will continue to monitor developments as part of our assessment uh, process. And once again, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman who acts as such a brilliant conduit between his constituents uh, and uh, the government. And I'm grateful for his uh, work on that. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the face of disgraceful attacks on aid trucks at the Gaza border, mm. the Israeli security minister is reported to have said that he believes it is not protesters who should be stopping the trucks because it is the job of the cabinet to stop the trucks. This view cannot be allowed to stand. Will the British government sanction the violent protesters who are destroying aid and their supporters within the Israeli government? Well, well as uh, she will know, uh, we have uh, not been shy about sanctioning uh, some of those who have conducted a, a, some of the settlers who have been uh, in, involved. And we, will, we don't talk about uh, future sanctioning across the floor of the House, but she may rest assured that we are very alert to the opportunity for doing more on that. And uh, she repeated what had been sent, said by one senior Israeli official about the position in Rafa. She will know that that is not the position of most of the senior uh, Israeli members of the Cabinet, and it's certainly not the position of the British government. Tom Hunt. Deputy Speaker, no, no organisation, international or otherwise, is beyond reproach. And it always gets it right. Of course you can question what they come out with. What I find disturbing here, though, is there is almost an exact equivalence between Hamas leaders who carried out the most disgusting and brutal, deliberately targeted attacks on famous enemy, and the leaders of Israel. It's not talking about a few rogue elements within Israel. This is what I find concerning. But does the minister agree with me that it's really important to have solid and accurate data? We keep on hearing data that is coming from the Hamas-led health authority. We've had data over a weekend which is very different from that. Does the minister agree that it would help the debate for as soon as possible for us in here to have that accurate data? He is, he is entirely right, Mr Deputy Speaker, and he will have seen as I have the comments over the weekend about uh, the figures, the accuracy of figures, and the uh, very great likelihood that, in particular, the figures about women and uh, children who have died during this contest are not uh, accurate 
uh, at all. Um, so so I, I, I agree with this point on that. And, and the point that he makes about moral equivalence, which has also been made uh, this afternoon uh, during this statement, Mr Deputy Speaker, is one that I think will be widely shared both inside and outside the House. Chris Law. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the International Criminal Court, the highest criminal court in the world, has applied for arrest warrants for the Israel Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and the Defence Minister, Yoav Gallant, for the war crimes of murder and the deliberate targeting of civilians, crimes against humanity, and the deliberate starvation as a weapon of war against the people of Gaza. It's unequivocal. So does the UK Government now accept that it must do three key things? First, it must reconsider its unequivocal support to Israel by immediately suspending arms sales. It must call for an immediate ceasefire. And finally, it must restore funding to UNRWA so it can deliver emergency humanitarian aid. Well, on his first point, I simply don't think that now is the time to make those decisions about what we have heard from the ICC today. It would be premature. There is now a pre-trial uh, chamber which needs to consider the evidence and then reach a judgment. So I'm afraid I cannot go with him on that. On UNRWA, I have made uh, very clear uh, where we stand, and I hope that uh, the aid uh, that was delivered with British support by UNRWA in the future will be delivered, and I hope that UNRWA will be able to accept all the reforms <laughs> that we are requesting, which would enable us uh, to do that. And as I've also said, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are not in the position that we are withholding funding at the moment because we have fully funded up to the start of this month uh, our commitments to UNRWA. And, uh, he says that we should cease our support for Israel. We have been very clear that Israel must abide within international humanitarian law, but equally that we understand that Israel has the right of self-defence. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Foreign Affairs Committee were in the Egyptian-Gaza border area in March, where we uh, spoke with and visited a number of aid distribution centres, uh, where we heard accounts of how uh, some of the aid going into Gaza would be stopped because of the potential dual use of equipment, not just for humani hum humanitarian reasons, but also potentially being used by Hamas um, for military uh, and terror reasons. Uh, can he update the House as to the percentage of those trucks that are now getting through to deliver that aid? Well, I can, I can tell my honourable friend that the percentage, the number of trucks that are getting through is wholly inadequate. That is one of the reasons why we have made uh, 12 airdrops, 11 by the Royal Air Force, uh, and why we now have the Maritime Corridor. Uh, in terms of uh, the restrictions on what can be uh, transported by truck into Gaza, uh, that was a very significant uh, problem to begin with. Uh, that particular aspect has eased, as both sides have understood uh, the position of each on what is being taken into Gaza. But I'm afraid the amount of uh, material humanitarian support getting in by trucks is still woefully inadequate. Absolute calm. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, new polling by YouGov shows that 73% of the British public support an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and 55% support the UK suspending arms sales to Israel for the duration of the conflict. Does the minister recognize that his government is elected to represent the people of Britain, and will it finally represent the majority of the people in Britain and call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and suspend all arms sales to Israel? Well, the Honourable Gentleman knows that on arms sales, it's not for the whim of a politician at the dispatch box to decide for and against. There is a proper process based on legal advice to be followed, and he would not expect ministers to deviate from that entirely proper way of judging these things. Uh, in respect to the ceasefire, we all want a ceasefire, but we want a sustainable ceasefire, and that is why the government has consistently pressed, indeed endorsed by a United Nations uh, resolution, consistently pressed for a pause in the fighting to get the hostages out and allow aid uh, in. 
that would be the way to lead to a sustainable ceasefire as a precursor for a, a longer term uh, deal. And the British government will continue, I hope, with his uh, support and others on those benches to uh, prosecute uh, that endeavour. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. How can the Minister argue that his government respects international law when he denies the jurisdiction of the ICC in this conflict? Yeah. Well, I haven't uh, uh, denied the position of the ICC. Um, uh, what, I, what I've said is that we are, we are at an early stage in this process, and we cannot reach those uh, judgments. Uh, we cannot reach uh, those judgments at this point. Paulette Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We must not forget the civilians and their children are the innocent victims of this war. The UN says that 800,000 people have been forced to flee Rafa since the 6th of May. In Gaza, there is quite clearly nowhere left that is safe. So can the minister explain what he thinks the consequences should be for, for any, for any or, or, or all-out attack on Rafa of any forced displacement of civilians? Well, the, the Honourable Lady is correct that something like 800,000 uh, people have now uh, left uh, Rafa. Um, we have uh, managed to uh, get in through the pier over uh, the weekend 8,000 uh, uh, shelter kits, enough for around 40,000 people, but we are part of a, uh, of a growing consensus that is trying to provide um, uh, that uh, support. Uh, the Israeli uh, Defence Force uh, warned 400,000 people to leave, almost double that have, have left, and uh, we are doing everything we can to support them uh, in their new locations. And as I have uh, repeatedly made clear, we will not and cannot support an attack on Rafa without seeing a detailed plan, and we have not seen a detailed plan. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could the Deputy Foreign Secretary tell us in specific terms what military flights are taking off from Akrotiri that go to Israel? Is the Israeli Defence Force using Akrotiri? Are the US forces using Akrotiri? And also, what is the nature of the overflying of Gaza by the RAF? And is surveillance information being sent to the IDF in response to that? In short, what is the military relationship between Britain and Israel at the present time? Very good question. Well, the, the Right Honourable Gentleman, Mr Deputy Speaker, is an extremely senior member of this House, former leader of uh, the Labour Party, and he well knows that we do not comment on security information across the floor of the House. Um, can I just ask again, please could people just focus on the question, and also please remember that you would have had to have been here for the entirety of the statement in order to ask a question. So um, I'm taking you on your word on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Other countries now have suspended arm sales. Other countries have restored the funding going forward to UNRWA. Why are we now leading from the behind rather than leading from the front on this? And is it not right? that we now do the right thing, suspend arms sales and refund UNRWA. Well, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think I'm right in saying that uh, no country has suspended existing arms sales uh, um, arrangements and agreements. Um, but uh, the fact remains that we have our own regime in this respect. We act in accordance with uh, legal advice, and we will continue uh, to do so. Uh, in respect of UNRWA, I have set out for the House uh, the processes which we are going through, and he, like me, will hope that those processes will be successful. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Deputy Foreign Secretary enjoyed referencing Mr Gantz a number of times. He set out his conditions for the end of the war and a day after. In response, Prime Minister Netanyahu's spokesperson said, the conditions set by Benny Gantz are empty words. The meaning is clear, the end of the war. And he went on to say, an, a, establishing a Palestinian state is very clear now that Prime Minister Netanyahu wants a forever war 
and is opposed to a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine. What is the UK government saying to Prime Minister Netanyahu to ensure that he understands where we in the international community stand on this issue, as do many Israelis, including members of his own government? And what action is taken against Ben Gvir, Smotrich and the Prime Minister of Israel, who are very clearly trying to prolong the war in Gaza? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, I say to the honourable gentleman that what he is saying underlines the fact that Israel is a pluralist democratic society where there are different views. And in respect, he asks me what the British government is saying to Prime Minister Netanyahu. I can assure him that both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary have uh, frank and open and detailed exchanges on these matters. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is the position of the Liberal Democrats that the UK government should give its backing to the ICC. If the Conservative government does not believe that the ICC has jurisdiction, then which international institution or legal mechanism does the UK government intend to look to to ensure that any breaches of the law of war on the front line can be prosecuted? Well, as, as the Honourable Lady knows, we make our own judgments on international humanitarian uh, law, and uh, we, are, we, are quick, we are quick to uh, come to the House if anything changes, but nothing has changed since the Foreign Secretary uh, made his comments in Washington, I think, uh, in early uh, April. Um, and um, I would just add to her that on the subject of the ICC's announcement today, I hope the House will accept that it is premature to respond further before the pretrial chamber has considered the application for uh, warrants. Tom Desi. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which has today applied for arrest warrants against Prime Minister Netanyahu, the Hamas leader and others, must be respected, contrary to what the Deputy Foreign Secretary said earlier. And I must correct the record for him. Uh, and where, and he would said, and I quote, we do not think the ICC has jurisdiction yeah, exactly. in this case. Yeah. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, given that the Israeli government has ignored for the past three <laughs> months the UK uh, Parliament's a past motion as proposed by the Labour Party for an immediate ceasefire, but is now instead planning a full-scale offensive on Rafa, which would be an absolute humanitarian catastrophe. Can the Deputy Foreign Secretary confirm that if that planned assault does go ahead, will the UK government suspend arms or component sales to Israel? Well. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's very kind of him to seek to correct the record, but his, his uh, repetition of what I said was absolutely uh, correct, um, and uh, we've said that from the outset, so he shouldn't be particularly surprised at that. And I'm, I can't, I can't uh, foretell what the consequences will uh, be in respect of Israeli actions, but I can tell him what the position of the British government is about an operation in Rafa which does not respect international humanitarian law, and that is why we said that we cannot support it unless we see a detailed plan. Debbie Abrahams. Deputy Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe that international law must be observed. As such, we want to see our arms sales components being, uh, sales being suspended, and we also want to see the perpetrators of violence against innocent civilians, whether Israeli or Palestinian, are held to account. I'm still unclear from the Deputy Foreign uh, uh, Secretary what he believes in and what his government believes in. Do you believe in the in international law and upholding that? Yeah. Um. Mr Deputy Speaker, it should come as no surprise to the House that the Government, of course, not only believes in international humanitarian law, but seeks to uphold it. And I have set out very clearly in the House on a number of occasions exactly how we carry out our duties uh, in uh, that uh, respect, and I hope that will give her confidence. Um, and in respect of the International Criminal Court, I would say to her that she is jumping too far ahead. We have set out the limited decision that has been made and announced today, and we should not jump ahead of that. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Earlier on in, in the statement, the Deputy Foreign Secretary said uh, the House should expect we will be restoring funding to UNRWA. It sounds like the Government has made its mind up. If that decision has been made, 
given the absolutely horrendous yeah. humanitarian situation in Gaza, why don't we just get on with it? Yeah, and, if, yeah. and if there is any chance that funding is not going to be restored, what's the government doing to get an alternative plan for that humanitarian aid to get in? Well, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government operates through other agencies as well as UNRWA. We've been uh, very uh, close indeed to the WFP, through which an enormous amount of uh, humanitarian aid uh, is uh, distributed. And uh, the point I would make to him about UNRWA is that we will go through these uh, stages, which I've set out clearly uh, to the House, but uh, he can rest assured uh, that uh, from my discussions with the United Nations Secretary General in New York uh, just over a week ago, we know that UNRWA is funded uh, for the moment, and we hope that our own funding, subject to the results of the OIOS inquiry, subject to the implementation of the Kelowna report, will be restored. Joanna Cherry. Mr Deputy Speaker, on the issue of the jurisdiction of the ICC, the government's statement is out of step not just with the prosecutor, but also with the impartial independent panel of experts on international law from whom he sought advice, which consisted largely of lawyers from this jurisdiction, by that which I mean England and Wales, not my own. Here's what they said, and I want the Minister to tell me what part of this is wrong. The panel agrees with the prosecutor's assessment that the ICC has jurisdiction in relation to crimes committed on the territory of Palestine, including Gaza, under Article 12.2a of the ICC statute. It also agrees that the court has jurisdiction over crimes committed by Palestinian nationals, nationals inside or outside Palestinian territory under Article 12.2b of the statute. The ICC therefore has jurisdiction over Israeli, Palestinian or other nationals who committed crimes in Gaza or the West Bank. It also has jurisdiction over Palestinian nationals who committed crimes on the territory of Israel, even though Israel is not an ICC state party. The basis for the court's jurisdiction is that Palestine, including Gaza, is a state for the purpose of the ICC statute. The ICC's pre-trial pre chamber has already ruled yeah. that the court's jurisdiction extends to Palestine yeah. as a state party to the ICC statute on this basis. That is the opinion of an illustrious list of mainly uh, English lawyers, with the exception of my dear colleague, Baroness Helena Kennedy, who of course is a Scot, although at the English <laughs> bar. Can the minister, and I see he's got one of the law officers sitting beside him, can the minister tell me which part of that opinion is wrong? Yeah. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady is an immensely distinguished uh, advocate and lawyer, and uh, she will have read the uh, letter signed by no less than 600 lawyers, which broadly agrees with what she has said. But she may also have read the letter from, I think, a 1,000 lawyers who disagreed with that, which shows that there are many different interpretations on this matter. Uh, hers is one, and the view of the government, as I have set out, is another. What do you think? Mr Deputy Speaker, does the Deputy Foreign Secretary not recognise the damage that is being done to the UK's standing around the world on the rules-based international order and international humanitarian law? Firstly, uh, with his government's refusal to accept the ICJ ruling and now the ICC. He says he does not believe that the ICC prosecutor seeking warrants will help, but at what point will he accept that the situation couldn't get any worse? Well, the point, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have always made is we do not think it is helpful for the court to intervene in this way at this point, because the main uh, purpose is to get the hostages out and food and humanitarian resources uh, in. And so that is the position that uh, the British government takes. Of course we respect the court, but that doesn't mean that we can't give our view on what the court does. Sir Chris Bryant. Mr. Speaker, I rather agreed with the comments by the Chair of the Intelligence and, Select Committee, Intelligence and Security Committee earlier about the ICC, though I would gently point out that I don't think there's a single member of this House that supports the actions of Hamas on the October the 7th, and in fact every single one of us has rightly condemned them. And for that matter, even very long-standing friends of Israel have offered criticisms of the actions of the Israeli government over these last few months, as have many Israelis. But I wonder whether he can clarify something for me. He suggests that there are 800,000 uh, Palestinians who have had to move out of Rafa in the last week or so. Um, he also suggests that not enough um, humanitarian aid is getting through, and that is because 
the, the Israeli government is refusing to let it through. He has also said that the Israeli government has a right to defend itself, we all agree with that, but within the bounds of humanitarian, international humanitarian law. Who is to judge that international humanitarian law if it is not an international court? Surely it can't just be a set of politicians sitting in the Foreign Office yeah. making it up out of their own minds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on, on his last point, uh, that is absolutely not the case. What ministers do is they take legal advice and they act within it and they take legal advice on international humanitarian law. And we've been very clear that uh, wh wh where we stand, the Foreign Secretary made the point in April, I think, in, in Washington. If anything changes, then, of course, we will tell the House. But uh, we cannot act on the whim of politicians or ministers in the House. We act in accordance with the law, and, and that is what we will continue to do. Yeah. Rachel Hopkins. Yes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister did say earlier that the Government condemns all attacks on aid workers and supports the UN call for an independent investigation into the killing of aid workers in Gaza. Can I ask the Minister if he is of the same view when it comes to the over 100 journalists who have been killed during the conflict? Uh, of course, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. We, we, we are appalled by the scale of death and destruction that has taken place. And what we say about protecting journalists, which uh, is something this House has always championed, uh, never more so than when my right honourable friend was Foreign Secretary, uh, applies equally well. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. I've listened very carefully to the Deputy Foreign Secretary, and I have to say his arguments I find wanting, that the ICC thinks that there are reasonable grounds, the actions of senior Hamas officials amount to war crimes matters, that they think that there's reasonable grounds, that the operations authorised by Prime Minister Netanyahu and his Defence Minister amount to war crimes matters. Given that the ICC prosecutor believes he has acted within the Rome Statute, and as the UK is a state party to the ICC, will the United Kingdom uphold any application in this territory if requested by the Office of the Prosecutor? Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman is premature in seeking to uh, ask the government to exercise any such uh, judgment. And as I said earlier in this statement, now is not the time uh, to make these decisions. We need to wait uh, for the pre trial uh, chamber to consider the evidence and then reach a judgment. Jim Shannon. Any loss of innocent life, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is truly horrific and is to be avoided at any possibility. However, latest UN reports indicate that Hamas, who are murdering terrorists, as we all know, uh, have inflated the statistics for death in the areas that have been proven to be massively overstated. What steps can be taken to ensure that we are all working for independently verified information and not propaganda, taking into account the fact that Israel have taken greater steps than any other democracy in history to give a, a warning and, and circumvent the loss of innocent life as far as possible in this war? Yeah, yeah. Well, we do think, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that Israel must do more in terms of deconfliction. But he is right that the use of lawyers in targeting, the use of Israeli lawyers in the planning of military activity, not uh, dissimilar to what we do in the United Kingdom, is uh, very important. And I'm grateful to him for the balance which he has expressed, as he always does. Andy Slaughter. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, this country used not only to respect but champion international law. The Minister's dismissal of ICC procedures today confirms how far the Government has fallen from its <coughs> adherence to the rule of law. Why is the Government undermining the Court and its British Chief Prosecutor as he attempts to call to account war crimes, including extermination, murder, hostage-taking, starvation, targeting civilians and persecution as a crime against humanity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm surprised, Mr Deputy Speaker, at the Honourable Gentleman putting it that way. He's an extremely uh, distinguished lawyer, and uh, I hope that he will recognise that the point I am making is that the House uh, is rushing uh, to conclusions which are not merited at this stage in the process. Yes. Alistair Carmichael. 
Speaker. Whatever opinion the Minister has on the subject of jurisdiction, the arbiters on that as a point of law will be the judges of the ICC. So, in the event that any or all of the warrants being sought by the Chief Prosecutor as announced today are to be granted, can the Minister confirm that the UK Government will render any assistance necessary for their execution? Is that not what a government that respects the rule of law would do? Of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, what I can confirm is that the British Government will always act in accordance with the law. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, there is now a perception that the level of evidence that the United Kingdom Government requires to make a determination on whether war crimes have taken place and to act upon them seems to vary with its attitude towards the country being alleged to commit those war crimes. Does the Deputy Foreign Secretary not understand the irreparable damage that is being done to the reputation of the United Kingdom internationally as a defender of international humanitarian law by this inconsistency? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I simply do not recognise the Honourable Gentleman's description of what the British Government is doing. The British Government is absolutely consistent. It always acts in accordance with uh, the uh, rule of uh, law and will always continue to do so. Khalid Mahmood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. For the avoidance of any doubt for members across the Chamber, I have since 2007 opposed Hamas and opposed their atrocities on October the 7th and continue to do that. So there are no sides as far as I am concerned. I think the actions taken by the IDF need to be corrected as well and we don't need to be held to account on that. The Deputy Foreign, the Deputy Foreign Secretary has said to my right honourable friend that the ICC is not in jurisdiction. To the uh, SNP spokes, uh, spokesman, uh, he said that the pre-judgment court hasn't read. To the learned lady in the SNP, he has said that there, we have to wait until it's not the right moment. Does he believe that ICC has jurisdiction on this issue, and will he give a straight answer, yes or no? Uh, so, so, Mr Deputy Speaker, first of all, I'm grateful for his condemnation over many years of Hamas. Uh, and uh, he has repeated what I have said to other uh, members of the House this afternoon. Um, and uh, if I've understood him correctly, he is noting that I have been entirely consistent in all those responses. Sir Edwards. Mr Deputy Speaker, what are the steps that the government is taking with our international allies to help create the conditions needed for an immediate ceasefire that can be observed by both sides? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Uh, Britain was able, through some uh, skilful and deft diplomacy, to get everyone on side on the United Nations resolution, which was recently passed, which talked about a sustainable ceasefire. And the position that Britain has always held is that we need to get that pause to enable us to get the hostages out and to get uh, humanitarian supplies in, and the hope that that pause would lead to a sustainable ceasefire. Howell Williams. Mr. Deputy Speaker, neither the USA nor China nor Russia uh, are party to the ICC. Does the Minister therefore recognise that, as permanent members of the Security Council, the UK, along with France, have a special responsibility to support the ICC and to uphold international law? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Honourable Gentleman will have noticed that today I have been careful uh, to be very clear about our support for the ICC, but equally to urge the House not to rush to judgment in a process which has a number of stages. I apologise to those who didn't get in, but we will uh, take notice of your names and get you in uh, at another time. We now have to move on. Yeah, yeah. Points, points of order come after statements.